Okay, so good evening. This is lecture one for the Interpreting in Superior Courts Felony course. It's a continuation of the um, Interpreting in Superior Courts Misdemeanor course. Uh, this is a, a kind of a continuation. Usually this class, Felonies and Misdemeanors, is offered in one 10-week one, uh, course without any any interruptions. In this case, we divide it in the hybrid program, the misdemeanor first, then there is a there was a final exam, and then the felony. Because there is a lot more material in misdemeanor, uh, you as an interpreter will be participating in misdemeanor court a lot more than in felony court. Um, and there are many different variations of that material. Uh, by that I mean that you you do similar things on a continuous basis, but yet there are many different crimes that we have to do. Domestic violence, DUI, um, simple assault. There are many different ones. When it comes to felonies, uh, in most instances, um, interpreters who speak Spanish are required in drug-related cases, as well as occasionally some armed robbery cases, uh, and then in some other occasions, um, in the um, um, cases that involve, att um, involve attempted murder. So it's a little bit different. So we really have less selection of crimes in felony, whereas in misdemeanor, we have lots of different crimes, driving with a suspended license, revoke or suspended license, uh, indecent exposure. I mean, you, there are many more crimes that are classified as misdemeanors. So, as a result of it, there is much more material in a misdemeanor course, in the portion that deals with misdemeanor than the portion that deals with felony. And furthermore, it's the misdemeanor course, as you have already experienced, is pretty tough course, uh, very difficult course. And this course is way easier, although you may think, oh, felony, it's kind of impresses, right? Impresses people that you're interpreting felony court. But the reality of things is that you have learned most of the foundation, right, already, such as, for example, the rights are the same in both misdemeanor and felonies. Waiving or giving up rights are this is the same format. Uh, the consequences of the plea are the same, it's the same format. So when you start analyzing the two courses, you have learned most of the material uh, that will also be used in felony courts. This means that in this particular in this particular course that lasts five weeks, you're going to have a much much easier time than in the fellow in the misdemeanor course. But the the I'm sure that you haven't done everything that you had to do in the misdemeanor course. And I was, I'm sure that. In the lab, you don't have the speed sometimes. You still need to do some additional work here or there. You need to fine tune different skills. And I discussed that with you when you took your final examination. I, in some cases, when you took the oral exam, I told you clearly, you know, in the next course, make sure you do some more work and this and that. Well, this is going to be much easier course, much, much easier. But you have to be smart about this. You have to go back to the misdemeanor laboratory and complete those labs and become more familiar with that material, increase the speed, and so on and so forth. The practices that we're going to be doing in this course are quite similar to the ones that you did in misdemeanor court. And the reason why they are similar is because everything is pretty much the same. The only difference is that the crimes are different. So... Um, the only main difference really is the, the type of crimes and sometimes the fact that instead of probation, you talk a lot about more parole. Um, and also the, uh, the fact that uh, the way that the judge sentences defendant in felony court is a little bit different, not much more different, but a little bit different than in misdemeanor court. So we have a situation here where this course is after, you know, it's like the way I look at it is that you went all the way uphill in the previous one. Now you're going downhill. You're going downhill, but not very steep, right? So you're, you're really having a lot of 
a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of good time. You're going to have a lot of uh, time available. Um, and I don't want you to, um, I guess, waste that, waste that time by not doing anything. I want you to complete this course and you're going to find that you're going to have, you know, a lot of more time compared to what you had in misdemeanor. But go back to the misdemeanor course and start, start getting the speed in the simultaneous, start getting some of this nuisance in the transfers, review some of those structures. Some of you really need to do a lot of work on it. And of course, we're going to be concentrating in this course on issues or, or, or material that it is both for misdemeanor and for felony, such as advisement of rights, for example. Uh, and that's one that we need to start working on. And that material is actually in the misdemeanor lab, in the lab for the misdemeanor course. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a class that needs a little bit of guidance from my, my um, uh, side here. Um, because in the misdemeanor, you always had something to, to work, something to study and all that. Here, you may find yourself that from one week to the next, you don't have much lab work in your felony, but you do have a lot of work in your misdemeanor. The first thing that probably uh, kind of impress you is that when you download the manual, the manual has almost 100 pages. This is probably the, it's 87 if I'm not mistaken. It's a pretty thick manual. Hmm? Uh, the reason being that, I mean, don't be concerned. You should know most of the terms here. But a couple of things that are included in this manual is what we call reference material. And the reference material, we begin, which begins on page 54, will now take all the terms that you have studied, okay, in this program. And all those sentences that have you know, some, what we call in the last course, we call it those uh, uh, structures, legal structures. And they are classified by proceeding. So if you go to page 55, you know, you don't have to, but I just want, you have, uh, it talks all about the different type of terminology that may come out in an arraignment, right? Um, and then on page 56 is on a proceeding called progress report. Uh, and then on 57 is when the change of plea, when the defendant, similar to Judge's Bench Guide Parts 1 and 2. But you will find the phrases that are usually used. And th that may include new material because it includes also the legal, the courtroom jargon there. So it's very valuable information. Uh, preliminary hearings, we have everything. And, and not only that, it has all the motions, all the objections, okay? It has all, you know, the, all, the, all the vocabulary that applies to jury instructions. It's extremely valuable. Uh, we don't, the state exam doesn't include too much jury instructions. They should though, but doesn't include it simply because the state exam feels that your instructions is something that you won't do on a regular basis. And that's kind of true because these jury instructions are only used when you have a trial, when you're interpreting in a trial. And we haven't actually looked at trials, but in this class we will. And the interpretation of a trial is very demanding, but you don't have that many trials uh, on, on, a, on an average month of the year. Uh, there are, however, some interpreters that are assigned to long calendars or some interpreters that are assigned to jury trials only, and those are only interpreting trials, they're interpreting trials all the time. But uh, lately they are not, uh, most interpreters, interpreters coordinator prefer to kind of float the interpreter in different areas. So we don't do that many trials, but when you do a trial, the vocabulary that is used in terms of the jury instructions and things like that are, is, ex, is very, very challenging. So here, this will give you all that information about jury trials, all the key expressions. And then there is one part on sentencing, page 68 and 69, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, those are the expressions, the, the phrases. And then it also has juvenile court on page 70. That's a completely different vocabulary. It's a different, different animal, juvenile court, um, simply because juvenile court 
what they try to do is to mask the fact that the person or that individual committed a crime because you don't want people to know you want to protect the minor blah 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 because he's a minor and you know you will be shocked when you interpret in the courts sometimes a, a 12 year old kid kills another kid by by accident but kills another another kid and uh, that 12 year old kid gets only probation so you will be kind of shocked about how that juvenile uh, court area works and then they what they do in general in juvenile court is um, they mask the the meaning for example they would not use just to give you an example uh, felony they will use it's a 707 b offense it's a violation of section 707 subsection b of the welfare and institutions code because that's what regulates juveniles and 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 you can see that how different it is than felony right they don't want to say the word felony they don't want to say the word misdemeanor so um, in fact they don't want to say complaint they use petition mm -hmm. they don't want to say da they use petitioner so we have all these variations that apply to juvenile the state exam do not up to this point does not include juvenile terminology but in most in jurisdictions when you become certified that's probably one of the first place where you're going to be going to interpret and i wanted to you to have the the key structures because otherwise you would be completely lost in juvenile court the same thing is true for what we call oops children's court children's court now See, in juvenile court, it's the, the, the minor, the child commits a crime. In children's court, the minor is the victim of a crime, usually by the parents. You know, sometimes the mother and the father hitting the kid. Um, sometimes the mother and the father basically assaulting the kid. And you may say that's not possible. Oh, yes, it is possible. You see a lot of interesting and very sad things happening there. So children's court is also a type of terminology that kind of mask everything. Um, and they use a lot of different numbers. They use a lot of different cases to refer to different things. Like a Dennis H is a preliminary hearing, a Dennis H hearing. They will never use the last name of the, of the, of the, of the child. They use the first name and then the first letter of the last name. And, Neither do they do that in juvenile court. So that's important for you to have. We briefly discuss it here uh, simply because the structure in the legal system, at least in California, so I'm talking about California. I know some of you are from the East Coast. But in California, we have misdemeanors are classified uh, in they're heard in uh, misdemeanor and felonies are heard everywhere really but when it comes to now ha after the preliminary hearing when it really goes into when the judge determines that the defendant is going to be bound over to superior court for trial consignado al tribunal superior para ser juzgado and because that 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 expression is going to be used any time that the person committed a felony so it goes to superior court and then the case starts all over again as a felony. And in that superior court, they deal with felonies and they also deal with juvenile and they also deal with uh, children's court and they also deal with civil court. So uh, superior court here in the, uh, although nowadays everything is superior, about 20 years ago, there used to be municipal court where you heard misdemeanor cases and superior court where you heard felony, juvenile, children's, civil, probate, and all that stuff, courts. Um, so, 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 so the, there is some value to learning some of these particular uh, proceedings in the in a felony course, not because they are felonies, but because when the interpreter is sent to interpret in a felony case, the interpreter is going to be sent to felony court. And felony court may have 10 floors, and in floor number three is all juvenile, and in number four is all probate. 
And when you are interpreting there, you, you may be going to, you know, the real felony like uh, attempted murder, like criminal jurisdiction, but you may also be asked to interpret in, um, in the juvenile court because it is part of the building. So we want to look at that as well. Um, so we have that. And then what's interesting also is that in some trials, in some uh, specific trials, it's possible that, um, that there will be expert witness testifying. And when there is an expert witness testifying in a trial, uh, you need to interpret using the simultaneous technique for the benefit of the defendant who speaks Spanish, obviously. And they could be an expert witness in firearms, expert witness in forensic pathology, it could be expert witness in drugs, it could be expert witness in gang terminology. And this reference material includes some vocabulary for those particular areas. So expert witnesses are also included here. So you have really a good, good reference material so that when you start working in the court system, you can take that with you and have it available. It's going to be very handy simply because uh, you will find that it is divided into different proceedings, particularly the first six months that you start working in the in the uh, in the uh, in the courts. Mm -hmm. So, um, do you have to study those that reference material? No, I'm not going to ask you to study that. Um, I will have to tell you. I, I do want to tell you that most of the material in that in this book, you know it all already. There might be some differences here, or there, some new expressions and stuff, but compared to the previous course. The number of words that you're going to, are going to be new to you, it's, it's going to be quite limited. There won't be that many. I would say maybe 15%, 20% of the number of words that you had to study in the previous course. So that's where you will have more time. Now the, uh, and that's why you have to use that time uh, to do laboratory practices from the previous course as well as this, the course uh, here. Okay. Um, Okay, so having said that, what will be, if you ask me, what's the difference between an interpreter who works in misdemeanor and an interpreter who was in, works in felony court? And, and furthermore, let's ask this question. Are you, can you decide where to go? Can you ask the interpreter's office, I want to do misdemeanors, I want to do felonies? The answer to that question is no, you cannot. They will send you to misdemeanor court if they need you there. They will send you to felony court if they need you there because your certification is for both jurisdictions. And what is the main difference? There are many differences, many differences. So let's look at it from different perspective. From the perspective of the interpreter, one of the things that you're going to notice is that in felony court, you have fewer trials than in misdemeanor court. You have a lot more pleas, guilty pleas. You will also notice that most pleas in felony court are guilty pleas, not no contest pleas. You will also notice that everything is takes longer in felony court. And the reason being the following. You have to remember that when you go to felony court, it's because you committed a felony, right? And if you commit a felony, your punishment will be served in state prison. One of the characteristics of serving time in state prison is that you don't get any credit in state prison. In other words, if you have to serve three years, you're going to be there three years. Whereas if you are in misdemeanor court, then you deal mainly with county jail. And in county jail, you do have a lot of credit. So what happens when the defendant committed a felony that has the potential of six years in state prison? Well, the defendant is in the process of being prosecuted, right? So it's, it's being tried. So the defendant is going to make, or his attorney, is going to do whatever it takes to make sure that everything takes longer because that defendant, while the defendant has to appear in court, will not be sent to state prison, will remain in county jail. And while remaining in county jail, all the credit will apply. So that means that if the, the attorney can 
has is a good attorney and can keep that defendant in jail for one year, you may end up leaving jail and going to state prison with a credit of three years. Meaning that now when you go to uh, to state prison, you have already credit for three years. Your punishment is six years, so you only serve three years. And those are actual three years. Meaning that there you're going to be there three years. So it's that's why all cases take a lot longer in felony court. A lot longer. It, the, the attorneys purposely try to keep their clients there. So it's a tactic that works very well because, you know, imagine if the punishment is three years, you may end up leaving state uh, county jail with all the credit and you don't have to go to state prison. Now, obviously, the DA knows that and tries to speed up the process. But in general, you know, it does take time. So as an interpreter, you're going to realize that you don't have the number of cases and the intensity that you will experience while interpreting misdemeanor court. Misdemeanor court is about pro getting people, you know, it's like, it's, like, um, uh, it's like a factory bell type of thing. Just, just get them out, ta, 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 like that. So it's all very quick, which adds a lot more stress uh, to the interpreter because uh, they want you to do things right away. And there are more people that commit misdemeanors, right, than felonies. So this is much, the volume is higher. So you, you, you do work, uh, you know, you do work a lot more. Whereas in felony court, everything is slower. In fact, I remember in felony court, when I worked in felony court, the afternoons were almost completely dead. Nothing happened. All, all, anything that happened was in the morning. So that means you can go to your office, you can rest, you can read a book, you can do whatever you want, uh, because there's probably not going to be any need for you to to appear. Now, you have to remember that if you are working in felony court, you may be asked to go to, um, I don't know, family law, because it's part of the felony courts, or juvenile, or children's court, or whatever the case is in the afternoon. And that happens occasionally, but the action really in felony court is mainly in the morning, whereas in misdemeanor court is all day long. So you do have more time. Um, the proceedings are kind of identical in many ways, except that the crimes are very different. The only difference between misdemeanor and felony is that in felony court, when there is a trial, you have to be very accurate because a mistake by the interpreter in a trial could make a big difference in terms of sentencing the defendant into state prison. Instead of three years, you, the person may get six, seven years because of the mistake in the interpretation without anybody noticing it. But sometimes you can make serious mistakes, right? Um, and, and that will be maybe when you are doing the consecutive interpretation and you don't remember an answer and you kind of make things up a little bit because you remember partially but you're not sure and suddenly you're saying things that are a little bit more um, incriminating to the defendant uh, and that can start adding time in state prison. So do interpreters like to work in misdemeanor or in felony interpreters like to work in both uh but once you have a lot of years in the field at the beginning you really want to work where the action is right so misdemeanors but when you have a lot of have done this for quite some time felony court is a really nice place to work because you have a lot more free uh, free time in terms of vocabulary is it more difficult no it's the same there is nothing major or nothing different in felony court compared to misdemeanor except the crimes. Now, the other difference is that you're going to be dealing with people who committed very serious crimes, rapes, rape, uh, sexual abuse, murder, attempted murder, armed robbery. You know, so these are crimes that make make you feel a little bit um, intimidated because you're going to be in the in the uh, lockup area and interpreting for somebody who committed a very serious crime like a, like a murder. Uh, just to give you an example, and this is where the ethics and the protocol become so important. 
Of course, ethics and protocol is important in misdemeanor court as well, but in felony court is even more important. It requires a lot more. Um, the interpreter needs to apply those a lot more. So let me just give you an example. Uh, while working in felony court um, here in Los Angeles, there was uh, a defendant who had killed his uh, girlfriend. Um, and the allegation is that he stabbed her many, many times and that he let her bleed to death um, and, um, and so on and so forth. So they wanted, they prosecuted him. Obviously, so we went to lock up with the attorney and the attorney uh, was telling the defendant, you know, I, I think you should enter a guilty plea because if we go to trial, it will be complicated. It was the day of the trial. In fact, it was, it was actually, it was actually the day that the defendant was scheduled to testify. So they weren't talking about a guilty plea. So the attorney went to lock up with me and explained to him how, you know, what type of questions he was going to ask the defense attorney did. So while that was happening, and of course, at all times, the defendant said, you know, uh, to the attorney, you know, I didn't commit the crime and no, no cometí ningún delito. Yo la quería mucho. Era una muy buena persona, blah, 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 blah. See, what happens is that the attorney was called to go to the courtroom while I was there in the cell with the defendant uh, in the lockup area. Of course, I'm not on the same side. There are bars that separate you with the defendant. And while waiting, um, I was waiting there because the attorney told me, just wait, it's just only a couple of minutes. Well, it was more than a couple of minutes. And when the, when the court is in session, they lock the door that goes to the courtroom. So if I wanted to get out, I couldn't get out. So I was stuck there, which is, happens com very often. It's not a big deal. But as I was sitting there, this defendant started confessing the crime and giving me details of that crime. You can imagine that if you're going to, in, a, in an, hour, an hour later, you're going to be interpreting for this defendant while he's testifying and you're going to be doing using the consecutive mode, what you hear now, which is an hour earlier, may have an impact as to how to fill in the blanks in the, uh, in the answers. Because you may forget certain portions of it in the consecutive. So sometimes what you're getting the information from this guy that he's confessing the crime can have an impact. You may um, inadvertently, uh, you may basically start adding things to this. Um, but this guy started telling me, you know, la, 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 la tuve que matar porque era una vieja que yo no la aguantaba más y le di 15 puñaladas y le di una en el cuello. So I had to say, señor, no me diga más nada, por favor, yo tengo que interpretar para usted. And then they keep going, right? They say, mire, pero es que yo necesito con, confesarme con alguien, decirle que yo la maté porque este, no le voy a decir a estos a, esto, a los jueces y a los, a los abogados y la maté y esto y lo otro I, I didn't know what to do honestly I couldn't get out so as the when the attorney came back I actually told the attorney your client confessed the crime to me and the attorney went like this and now here we have a very interesting ethical dilemma uh, first of all should I interpret for this person um, an hour later, the answer is really no. Hmm? They should, or in other words, the attorney for the defendant should ask the court to find another interpreter. But that will be very risky because if I have been interpreting in that trial for about three weeks and then suddenly I'm not interpreting for the defendant you know, because I mean, when you're doing a trial as an interpreter, you're interpreting for the defendant. So most of the time it's, it's simultaneous while the case is going on. But when the defendant is testifying, you have to go to the witness stand and interpret with the defendant using the consecutive mode. So the answer to that question is no, I should have not. And the attorney, but if, if the attorney asks for a replacement of the interpreter, then the DA will wonder why and can ask me to now 
become a witness in this case and ask me questions about why. And it's under penalty of perjury, so I would have to tell the truth. And therefore, as a result of it, one question will lead to another, and then the attorney, the DA, may end up knowing that this guy confessed everything to me. So the attorney said that, told me, you know, we're not going to do that. You're going to interpret. She said, are you, you going to be okay? I said, sure, I'll be okay. Um, I'm going to interpret. But it was kind of awkward because questions were asked and the answers provided had nothing to do with his confession, right? Um, and you have to have an incredible amount of concentration not to mix both versions. Uh, and the best way to do in cases like that, if you find yourself in a case like that, is to basically uh, stop the defendant often so that you're interpreting very short segments. What you don't want while using the consecutive is to have any type of uncertainty that you don't know. You know, you don't remember this or you don't remember that or the, the, the answer is too long because that's when you, uh, without knowing, will uh, fill in the blanks by using the version that was given to you by the defendant in lockup. So these are, you know, issues that do not occur in misdemeanor court. Uh, these are issues that in a way tell you how serious it is to interpret in felony court. It really is a serious matter, particularly when you're interpreting in a trial. If it's just a plea or if it is just a conversation or, or, or they're talking about they meaning the attorneys and they're talking about the case or whatever the case, whatever, whatever it is, um, that's not too complicated. But when it comes to trials, felony trials are the most difficult ones. So you have to be aware of it. Hopefully, you won't get felony trials for some time. They're not going to give them to you right away, hopefully, hopefully. Uh, but I had students who passed the exam and the, next, the first day they go and work, they were in a felony, uh, felony trial. So there are no guarantees. So I, that's kind of the difference between the two. And um, in terms of what you need to learn as an interpreter, there are certain things that we're going to be discussing throughout this course that are very unique to felony court. One, one example. Uh, when they sentence the defendant, the judge will always, always, in a felony case, indicate the low, the high, and the midterm for that crime. So, for example, if, if it's um, attempted rape and the minimum that it's going to get is three years and the maximum nine, the judge is going to say attempted rape is at three, six, nine years in state prison which means three is the low one, nine is the high one, six is the midterm. So that's kind of a difference. If it's armed robbery, you know, you may hear uh, armed robbery is one, two, three years in state prison. It doesn't mean 123. So that's something we need to, to look at. And then the other thing is the type of crimes, right? But you already know the crimes, so there should be no major issues there. Hmm? So in this class, we're going to learn some new stuff. In fact, the first part on lesson one, we're going to look at this uh, after we do our first practice. But the very first part in this manual on lesson one, still misdemeanor material. Okay, so we're going to discuss that uh, later on. So let's look at any question. Is there a way to shadow an interpreter to get an idea of how to work in the courtroom? They won't let you because you cannot be in the area where the interpreter is going to be moving. You cannot be close to the judge. You cannot go to lockup. You cannot do any of that stuff. Um, you can be in the audience portion and see what the interpreter is doing. But first of all, you cannot hear the interpreter. You cannot go to the interesting areas such as lockup with the interpreter. Um, you cannot hear perhaps what the, uh, when they have an attorney-client conference, you cannot really hear that. So there's no much that you can get out of it. Now, the County of Los Angeles, my understanding is that the first week they do let you shadow uh, an interpreter. So it, some counties do that, do have that. 
Okay, so what we're going to do before we start working in with the felony court material and with the material for this class, we're going to do some practice from the previous course. See where you are at, you know, just do a little bit of practice there. Uh, we're going to do maybe 20, 30 minutes of practice. Then after that, we'll start discussing what's the material on the lecture one. We're going to look and see how it is. The other thing I wanted to tell you is that in this class, you're going to be hearing a lot of actual hearings from court. So I, I have tapes that are from court. They're pretty old, but it doesn't matter. Nothing has changed. Everything is the same. Uh, there's one thing that nothing that doesn't change that is very static is anything has to do with law. So um, pr procedure is the same. Everything is exactly the same. So you're going to get to actually practice as if you were in the courtroom. And that's kind of neat, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, the only difference is that when you are actually in the courtroom, you can see, you can see uh, the people, and that makes it a little bit easier. You have that visual image, but when you are interpreting here, you're going to be able only to hear. And there are some challenges. We're going to see. Uh, you're going to be experiencing how difficult sometimes it is interpreting court, not because uh, the material is difficult, because the judge doesn't speak uh, speaks too softly or um, there is a lot of noise, you know, all that stuff I need to train you in this course. Because after you complete this course, technically you can go to any court and interpret. Uh, the way that this program was designed is that uh, once you finish felony, cor felony course, you are ready to start interpreting. There is, of course, perhaps a need to develop further the consecutive, but that's pretty much what you need to do. That's all. Just to work a little more on consecutive. And since mo many interpreters do not ever use consecutive because they never interpret testimony, then you can technically start working in the court system. The three uh, subsequent courses are mainly for preparation for the state exam. In the last one, the preparation for the oral component of the exam, that's where we put a lot more consecutive. We just so one thing is interpreting the court system, another thing is interpreting the exam. The court system has much faster speeds in simultaneous, the exam has much slower speeds. The court uh, system has shorter segments in terms of the answers provided by witnesses. Uh, in the state exam, they're longer. Uh, the uh, court, real court material that deals with site translation, which is the course I'm gonna, we're going to see next, next after this one, includes material similar to what you had in your previous course on those forms, number one, advisement of rights and stuff like that. Whereas in the state exam, there is a lot of material that is completely outside that. It's just more complex. Mm -hmm. So you can see that the actual exam doesn't match what we do in court, but that's the way it is. We will have a chance to practice interpreting in person. Uh, no, I mean, you cannot interpret if you're not certified. So you cannot interpret in person unless you do internships. But, but no, you cannot interpret criminal court. If you're not certified, they don't let you, they don't let you interpret. Can you explain the advantage of working for the courts versus working freelance interpret? The courts will require that you interpret in criminal matters, felonies and misdemeanors. When you work for the court, it will require that you do the um, family law. It will require that you do juvenile and it will require that you do children's court, as, we, as I just explained. Uh, if you work for agencies as a freelancer, then you will be working not in the criminal jurisdiction, but in the civil jurisdiction. And that will not necessarily involve a lot of court time. You will be doing a lot of depositions in attorney's office. And the depositions are related to car accidents, accidents on the job, malpractice, breach of contracts. It's all civil. There could also be some um, family law matters as well. So when you interpret as a freelancer, you're going to need to learn a little bit about civil because you're going to be lost. Remember, to pass the exam, you need to know criminal matters. Uh, the certification is you're certified as a court interpreter. 
but really you're certified as a criminal court interpreter. You're not really certified as a civil court interpreter because you need to learn a little bit more. Hmm? And it's possible, you can learn it, it's not too difficult, but it is a different, different situation. You're gonna use a lot more consecutive as a freelancer. And the pay is better, hmm? and there is more freedom, um, and um, many of the positions are canceled within the last 24 hours, so you get paid instead of, in, and you don't even have to go. So there are some advantages as well as some disadvantages. When we come to, when you get to the preparation course, the last course in this program, we look at civil a lot. So I don't want you to finish this program without having the necessary civil terminology. Uh, that's why I mean internships. I couldn't remember the word for it. You can do internships if the internships are offered in, locally. I don't know what we have right now. Uh, you can always send an email to Nora, N-O-R-A, at interpreting.com, and she's the one that handles internships. So feel free to do that. I think what we're going to do next is then a practice, simultaneous practice from the previous course, and other ones, towards the end, I'm going to introduce something new. But let's see where you are at in terms of that. I'm not going to monitor this first part as we did last time. Remember, I monitored you after the, for the break. I'm not going to be monitoring this part. I just want you to, you know, it's been a couple of weeks or so. Um, and, and, and that's basically, you know, what, what, uh, what we want to do. I just want you to start getting the flow. Mm -hmm. You were offering that a few years ago. Yeah, we are still offering it, but the problem is not us. The problem is the internship. Because of COVID, they, sometimes they have some internships over the phone. Um, sometimes they don't. So we don't know what's available. So that's something that changes every quarter. Are we able to access the material from the previous course? Yes, the material, actually you will be able to access the practices from the labs from the previous courses, from all the courses. Mm -hmm. uh, all you have to do is click where it says access online lab on the left. And then here it gives you simultaneous and consecutive techniques. Uh, those are the first two courses you took. And then the next one is misdemeanors and felonies. So when you access that, you're going to see that it has everything in a 10-week uh, format. So the first five weeks correspond, uh, four weeks corresponds to misdemeanor. The other weeks correspond to uh, felonies. And I will explain this further uh, today when we, you know, before the end uh, of the class so that you know how to, um, how to access the lab and what will be the things that I recommend that you do. Okay, having said that, let's do some simultaneous practice now for maybe about 25, 30 minutes, okay? So no monitoring, so don't worry about it. You don't have to access the monitoring site. I, we, we will, however, after the break, all right? So let's do that. This is gonna be simultaneous. It starts in about 30 seconds. <laughs> 